So before we start today's episode, just remember that although I am a attorney, I am not your attorney and I am not offering you legal advice in today's episode. This episode and all of my episodes are informational and educational only. It is not a substitute for seeking out your own advice from your own lawyer. And please keep in mind that I can't offer you legal advice. I don't ever offer any legal services, but I think I offer some pretty good information. One more thing before we get started. Also remember that I am based in the United States, so that's what I'll focus on today. With that, let's actually get into it. Hey guys, so I'm so excited for you to get to listen to this episode today. But before we get started, I have to ask for some patience and forgiveness and understanding. I am in the middle of a huge move, at least for me, and you'll never believe this, but I left my podcast mic and all of my related stuff on my desk with a little note that said, do not pack, do not take. And the movers took it and they packed it. Stuff happens. So in the midst of all that, I was without my normal mic. And so I apologize in advance. When you listen to today's episode, it doesn't sound as good as it normally does. So I promise you, if you're new to On Your Terms, this is not normally how things sound, but I am also all about just being real and bringing you the episodes that you need that are full of value and helpful content, but not today with the best audio. So with that, let's get started. Let's get into today's episode. And I so appreciate your understanding. We'll be back to really good audio very soon. Hey guys, welcome to a brand new episode of On Your Terms. Today is a good one. I got into all the PETA issues today. So PETA stands for pain in the... (laughs) And so we're going to talk all about PETAs today. I wish they were the like fluffy kind that I love from my favorite falafel place, but we're not talking about those kinds of PETAs. We are talking about pain clients, clients who cause you actual headaches, clients who may cause you a legal headache now or down the line. And the reason that this episode is so important is because, you know, you can have all the best legal stuff in place. You can have no legal stuff in place. And if you end up with a client like this, these are the clients who end up being legal headaches. So I want to help you in today's episode, avoid this as much as possible. So I'm going to go through warning signs, things for you to look out for, things that I experienced myself. I'm going to talk to you about when it's a good idea to cut bait and run from a problem client. We're going to talk a lot about prevention and how to avoid problem clients because I really just want you to avoid this as much as possible. At the same time, we're going to talk about how to kind of work through some of these situations when they come up and not take them personally or take them as meaning anything about us as a coach. And I talk with you a lot in today's episode about how normal this is, how this is something that everyone experiences, something that people at the top of the industry, at the bottom of the industry experience. And I just more than anything want to normalize these kinds of experiences with PETA clients for you today so that you don't feel any sort of way about you having these kinds of interactions with people. So With that, before we get into it, I um, hopefully my voice holds out because I have been very sick um, for the last couple of weeks. I wasn't able to talk or record any podcast episodes for, mm, I would say, at least two and a half weeks. I'm just coughing, coughing, coughing like crazy. So bear with me. My voice still isn't totally, totally normal. I'm also in the midst of a move. So I'm moving from Philly to New York, which I can't believe. I'm a Philly born and raised girl, never left. And It's kind of wild to me, but you can follow along on Instagram. That's been pretty fun. So I'm in the midst of all of that. And we've got a lot of fun stuff coming for you in the next couple of weeks at Sam Vanderweel and LLC. So keep your eyes peeled. Obviously, I'll announce it here. I'll announce it on Instagram. As you go and listen to today's episode, if it's helpful and you think that it would be helpful to your friends or your audience, please screenshot and share this episode on Instagram or your favorite social platform. Tag me at Sam Vanderwillen so that I know and can reshare. And of course, after you've listened, please send me a DM. Let me know what your thoughts are. I'm always taking new episode requests as well. With that, let's get into it. Hey there, and welcome to the On Your Terms podcast. I'm your host, Sam Vanderwielen, an attorney turned entrepreneur who helps coaches and online service providers legally protect and grow your online business using my DIY legal templates and my ultimate bundle program. So on this show each week, I bring you fresh tips about how to legally protect your business, but I also share about how to actually grow that business 
on your terms because it is so important to me that you are doing things your way. I'm all about that here and that is all about what you're going to learn today. So in this episode today, we're actually going to dive into a sticky topic all about problem clients. And can we just agree to call them PETA clients for the rest of this episode? So PETA stands for pain in the boop. <laughs> so I'm just going to call them PETA clients for the rest of the, the episode. I used to work with a guy at the law firm called people PETA all the time. And I thought it was really funny and I love PETAs. So it works. All right. So in this episode, we are going to talk about how to spot problem clients coming down the pipe, We are also going to talk about what to do when you've got a client who's a problem. And maybe it's the like old health coach in me, but I'm all about prevention. So we're going to spend a lot of time today talking about how we can avoid this as best as possible, right? But I'm also super practical and I've been through this myself and I know that you can cross all your T's and dot all of your I's and you can still land a PETA. So we are going to talk today about how to navigate these issues, how to legally protect yourself from these clients, how to legally protect yourself by avoiding these clients. The reason that I really wanted to have this episode with you today was because you know, so many people will come to me for contracts, obviously, and, you know, website policies. And they ask me questions about business insurance. And they ask me questions about, do I need an LLC or a sole proprietorship? And the point is, and, and something I'm very honest about is the fact that you can have like all of this stuff in place and be quote unquote, perfectly protected or as protected as you can be, which is the better saying when you, when you live in America or work in America. And you can still have a PETA client, right? And it can, that PETA client can still sue you or that PETA client can just be a PETA and and they can drive you nuts and make you question why you ever started this business in the first place. I'm not speaking from personal experience, just saying I could imagine a scenario where that would happen. So I want to address this with you today because I am very honest about the fact that you can like do all of the things right. You can get all my checklists off my website and check all those boxes, you can still end up with a client like this and you can still end up with somebody who scares the heck out of you and you're afraid they're going to sue you or they ask for their money back, even though you've done all the work or they sign up to work with you. And then they say to you like, oh, I was just trying to work with you because I'm going to start my own business. That's the same as yours, you know? And again, none of this is personal experience. It's all just random examples that I picked from my head. But we all end up like this, you know, and we we all end up experiencing things like this. I think another reason I wanted to have this episode with you today is to normalize this because I don't know about you, but I felt a lot of shame when I had my health coaching business. When I first left the law in 2016, I started my health coaching business. I had a lot of PETA clients for all different kinds of reasons. I had a guy who bought sessions for his wife. And then when his wife actually met me, she was like, no, I'm good. I don't want it anymore. I had people who, you know, would just be rude. I had people who would be very demanding, not respectful of boundaries. I didn't know how to set boundaries either. Right. So you're going to see a lot of common themes today where we might be frustrated at how someone is treating us, but sometimes it's an invitation for us to look in the mirror as well. Right. So we have a lot of these experiences and I don't want you to feel like, there's something wrong with you as a coach or as a provider, as a service provider, thinking like, I must not be a good coach if somebody's asking for their money back, or I must not be good enough if someone's asking to or not respecting my boundaries, right? These things are so normal. Not only have I experienced it, and I can tell you from personal experience that these things are really normal, but I am telling you that I'm also on the receiving end of, I don't even know how many text messages and DMs and emails and voice notes and everything else from friends and colleagues and other people in the industry, some people who have, you know, who are are the same people who are talking to you about how much money they're making, how incredible their lifestyle is on Instagram are the same people who are reaching out to me in the DMs, freaking out when somebody asks to to, um, have their money back on a $30,000 mastermind that they run, you know? So it happens to everyone. And I don't want you to take this as personal feedback. Really, there are two things you need to take away from PETA client experiences. And then we're going to get into like all of my tips for you about how you actually navigate these PETA people. And we're going to define what PETA people are. But really, there are two things that come from this. One is that this is an invitation for us to realize that we can't control other people. And sometimes you can do all of the things and check off all the boxes, just like I talked about earlier. 
And you can have the best, you know, intake forms and the best warnings on your website and disclaimers and all this kind of stuff. And you still end up with a PETA client. That's fine. And, and it just happens, right? But two is that this is always, whenever you have a PETA client or you've experienced some sort of PETA client situation, it is always an invitation for us to look in the mirror. So we are going to talk about that today. Where have we maybe let things slip? Where have we not held our boundaries? Where maybe do we not have any at all? You know, where can we look at our language, our copy, our marketing messaging, you know, whatever it is, our pricing strategy, even how are we and why are we attracting people like this? So With that, you know, I want to talk about a little bit about how PETA problems, PETA clients typically present themselves in our businesses. So either you've got like a PETA perspective client and then you're not sure whether or not you should take them on or you've got like a PETA current client and you're not sure if you need to kick them to the curb. That's that's kind of the the two main scenarios that I see. You can tell me whether you've experienced something different or you've experienced that as well. But I, if we all raised our hands right now, I bet everyone listening to this would be raising their hands as, as to whether any of us have ever experienced a PETA perspective client. And whether it's because your business is relatively new or you're maybe going through a rough time, you're trying to build your business or something like that, you're in need of, of building this business, you might feel tempted to take somebody on, even though your stomach is giving you all the intuition vibes of like, this is not a good idea. This is not a good fit. This is something's off, right? I don't, I feel like this person's going to be a PETA, but I need it, right? Or, but I, I need the experience or it must be me, right? A lot of times we turn it on ourselves or, or sometimes we think we're a hero and we think this person's a PETA. I can fix them, right? I can help it. I can overcome this situation. You mean well, but a lot of times that is what happens, right? But the point is you don't want to get in legal trouble when it's your client. You know, that's what we're most concerned about when you've actually exchanged money with someone, you've worked with them. We don't want you to either get sued for something that happens from your work together, or we don't want them. And what's more, way more common than getting sued is we don't want them asking for their money back after you've already performed the work. Or alternatively, we don't want them asking you to do more work, although they've already paid you. That's another thing I see with PETA clients a lot is that they will, you know, pay you the X amount of dollars and then they come back for more. They want more, right? And because people are frustrated and they feel guilty or they feel shame or whatever, they will be like, oh, I'll just give it to them. So I see a lot of that in the the PETA client world. When it comes to prospective clients, right? We are trying to prevent that scenario from ever happening. And one of the things that I feel most frustrated about when I hear, you know, so many of these stories and my my inbox fills up with these stories is that a lot of times when you guys reach out to me, there is so much of like, I knew this was going to be bad because, (laughs) right? Or I should have known that this was going to be bad because starting out, like this is how it started out and, and she was a problem from the word go. And I took her on as a client anyway. And then what do you know? this ended up happening, right? So a lot of times people's spidey senses are tingling, but we're not listening to them for whatever reason, or we're not acting on them for whatever reason. And then those are the clients that end up becoming legal problems. So the reason that I'm doing this episode and the reason I'm talking about this with you today is because you can have all that legal stuff in order, but if you are not listening to your spidey senses or you don't have certain things in place to kind of filter out people and make sure that you're working with the right people and you're standing up for yourself and and holding those boundaries, I am telling you, those are the people that end up becoming the problem, right? So I remember as a young attorney, when you become an attorney, you're primarily just concerned about billing. And so you're just like billing a million hours a month. And it's it's a wild experience. But I was a little businesswoman from the start, <laughs> from when I was very young. And I used to sell like lemonade on the side of the road. <laughs> but I was a little businesswoman and I wanted to build a book of clients. Like I wanted to also have clients of my own, even as a young attorney. And these people would come into my life, whether it was through like a personal connection or somebody I met at like some sort of networking function. And they were always like the most dysfunctional (laughs) situations, right? And I would go to my boss and I would say, good news. I got this, you know, inquiry. This person wants to hire us as their attorney and this is their problem and this is what they're doing. And I knew in my gut that this person was a PETA for lack of a better term, right? They were wild and they didn't want to listen and they were controlling or mean and angry. I mean, everyone was a little bit different, but 
let's just say like all of the alarm bells, all the red flags in the world were going off. Right. And I was so desperate at the time to be like, no, I can make this work. I just want to show the firm that I can do this. Right. I want to show them that I can build this business. I would take them on every single time they would end up being a major problem, right? They would end up costing the firm something, ask for their money back. They would just like fire us. Like it would just be, or it'd end up being not worth the amount of money they paid us at all. You know, we lost money on the, on the transaction. It was just a giant mess. And I thought that one of the things that I learned that was so helpful as an attorney was kind of like what you hear people say about dating, which I'm like the last person to give dating advice ever. But when somebody shows you who they are, you kind of have to believe them, right? And so maybe this is the Philly girl in me talking who like has a little bit of a hard time letting my guard down sometimes and all of that good stuff, but bear with me. I think that in business, if you are somebody like me who has a very quick intuition, you know, has a very quick read on people, you get this gut feeling Sometimes you don't trust yourself and you you go with like, oh, well, I should be doing this. I should take on business. I shouldn't turn people away. I have no right to turn people away, you know, or I should be helping them. They need my help. You know, if you're someone like that, like I am, then this episode is really for you because we've really got to train this muscle. It, this really is like a muscle. OK, and as your friend, I will tell you, this is not something I expect for you to get right today. Right. So this is something that is per- just like dating. It is perfectly fine for you to stumble through. You can go on a couple bad dates. You can have a couple bad breakups. Right. And there are going to be a lot of marriages in your future, a lot of engagements <laughs> to other clients. And that is amazing. That's what you're shooting for. But in order to get there, you're going to have a lot of bad dates. Right. So I just don't want you to feel like you've messed something up because you're not getting this right or you thought you were doing things right and things are going well for a while. And then a PETA client slips through the cracks. My business has grown so immensely in the last you know year or so. And we have PETA clients slip through the door because the business is so big now that I don't know who's coming in. Right. So it's always pushing me to look at things differently, to improve, to tinker. I am like a huge fan of being a scientist and experimenting. And I take it as feedback. I take it as data. I take it as an opportunity for me to look at the business and see where the holes are, see where my holes are, or also just like look up at the universe and be like, poof, PETA's, <laughs> you know, they just slip in sometimes. That just happens. It's okay. It really is okay. What wouldn't be okay though is a PETA slipping through and trying to stew you. And that's like, that is what I want to prevent first and foremost. Obviously, I also want to prevent them from ever asking you for your money back or something like that. So this has so much less to do with them, right? With the PETA. I know I spend a lot of time talking about PETAs. This has less to do with them and more to do with you and knowing who you are, what you do and what you will tolerate, aka your boundaries, what you are comfortable with, what you're willing to do to make the sale, to get the client, to do the work, whatever it is, right? And I also just want to put kind of a blanket disclaimer on this episode. And and whenever I talk about this subject, I always say this. It's not a judgment of the other person. Like what I'm talking about, I'm not trying to say like PETAs are bad people or that, you know, they're not, I, I don't know, a good coach if you work with other coaches or something like this. It's just that you and them are not a good fit. And that's totally fine. There's somebody else they're going to gel with, just like there are tons of people for me. They're like, huge people online that everyone loves. And I'm like, oh man, I can't, I had to unfollow and mute and all the things. It really bothers me. Everybody has got their different cup of tea and it's totally okay. I think it's such a waste of time to spend your time worrying about or trying to figure out like why those people aren't or why this person didn't like you or why this person didn't want to work with you and just spend whatever amount of time you would have been doing that on finding the people who do need your help because there are like way more people like that. Right. So, okay. as we get into this, I'm going to break this down in a couple of different sections today. In this episode, I'm going to talk about warning signs. I'm going to talk about when to run. So that's if you're already working with someone or maybe even if someone tries to sign up with you and you're you're like just about to work with them, when to run. Um, how to avoid problem clients, because I'm a big prevention person, and then how to terminate a client properly, right? Because there actually are a lot of legal, like, I don't know, landmines here about trying to properly and gently end a client relationship, because even sometimes terminating a client relationship can get you sued. So with that, let's get into it. 
Okay, so I feel like you can't talk about PETA clients without talking about warning signs. Um, Whether we're talking about dating or clients coming on board or hiring a contractor or whatever, there are a lot of people who give you warning signs. And what I hope you walk away from today is like, sure, I can give you a couple of examples of what some like hard and fast warning signs are. However, warning signs are really different for all of you. You know, what, what might be a warning sign to you might not be a problem for me. I'm super sensitive, so I probably have a, like a lot more warning signs of, and and as my business has grown, my warning signs list has gotten a lot longer, and I have that privilege and luxury now of being able to be like, no, nope, no thanks, right? But when I was in the beginning, I had a very short list of warning signs, and I didn't really have the luxury of being like, I don't want to work with this person. So I understand, and this list can grow, and this list can evolve, and it's not a hard and fast list, right? So this might be different for you, but. I overall, I want you to think about coming back to this concept that when somebody seems like a PETA or acts like a PETA, believe them, right? I want you to work on not making excuses for them and saying like, well, they're going through a hard time or they're sick or there's this. That might all be true and it might not fit with your boundaries. It might not fit with what you're looking for, the kind of vibe or the mood or the type of work that's required for you to work with them, right? I think one trend that I've always noticed as a warning sign when it comes to PETA clients is that people will ask you to twist yourself into a pretzel to accommodate them. I think one of the biggest pet peeves, I guess, of mine is that, you know, you go through as a coach or as a creative and service provider, you go through all this trouble and all this work to put programs together and packages or create products, digital products like me. And somebody asks you like, "Hmm, that's great. Like, thanks for spending all that time. But like, if you could just make it like this for me, like basically everything is supposed to be custom for them. Right. And this is a common trend that I see in our industry way beyond PETA clients. But in general, a lot of people struggle with the idea that they think everything is for and about them. (laughs) And so people have a hard time just taking things like as they are. Right. And we, I call it like the Starbucks of online business that, you know, people think they can like walk into my online shop and be like, I want extra foam, like super hot, light this, I don't even know, whatever, like all of the combinations. And you're like, no, this is not how it works. Like, it's just like, this is, this is here and everybody else seems to get along with it. So you're going to have to figure this out. Right. And again, coming back to what I said earlier, it's no judgment about that person. Maybe that customer needs something different than what I offer. That's okay. But I don't need to twist myself into a pretzel or my products into a pretzel to accommodate them because I'm telling you right now, the amount of time that you will spend pretzeling all over the place to try to twist yourself into different positions to accommodate people is such a waste of time. Because what that really means is that that person's not your ideal customer. If they don't need what you have, right? And if you've done things properly and you've designed your products and your programs to fit your ideal customer's needs, then that person's not your ideal customer. So all the time that you spend going around, right? And twisting your your services and, and products around for them is just a diversion, right? It's just creating a distraction. It's taking you away from what really matters and what you really need to focus on. So I think the pretzel twisting is was one of the biggest PETA kind of things or potential PETAs because what's going to happen is you're going to twist and you're going to give it to them. And you're going to create this different program or offer them a different coaching thing. They're going to start working with you and then go, "Hmm, I'm good. It turns out that you're not really what I was looking for. And what do you know? They gave you that warning sign. They told you up front when they asked you to twist yourself into a pretzel, they were telling you already that you were not the right fit for them, right? Because you didn't have what they wanted. And I'm not talking about, by the way, like I'm not, this is not such a hard and fast. Everything in life is not so black and white. So I'm not talking about you know, someone contacts you to create some sort of program and and you speak with them and it's like, they're really the right fit. It's just that they need this like different thing. I'm talking about like, you know, people contact me all the time and they will say like, can you let me have access to the ultimate bundle, but then give me all these different contracts and and templates and website policies for like a t-shirt shop, you know? And it's like, no, I don't do physical products. So if I spent, if I wanted to create an alternative to the ultimate bundle that was for physical products, right? then that's fine. I create something and then I sell it to the masses. But if every time I got one of those emails, I mean, I get emails about, I got an email the other day about somebody who makes doll heads. Not kidding. Um, I got an email from a lady who acts as a mermaid at like children's birthday parties. I get um, from Etsy shop people. I mean, all over the place that are different than what I do. And if I ran off and created products for every time I got one of those emails, 
I would be more exhausted than I already am because I'm in the middle of a move. Um, but I'd be super exhausted. And I would also be taking away all of my time from my core messaging and my core marketing, which are to coaches and online service providers and like service providing creatives, right? So it's a distraction. So we really need to take this as a warning sign, both legally and business wise. I'm always trying to co- combine those tips for you. And we need to make sure that we stay in our lane. I would say I have two more warning signs for you. So a second warning sign that I have for you is when somebody writes you their life story. <laughs> for some reason, I don't have data on this, but I feel like if I collected data, I would feel really confident about this, that when somebody writes you an email or contacts you on social media, and I mean, sometimes people will send me DMs that have 20 voice memos in them, or you know, they, they write me these emails telling me these like very personal, long-winded legal battles that they've been in from like divorces to other things that have nothing to do with what I do. I kind of take that as a like, not super respectful of boundaries, right? And it's a little worrisome in that case in particular, because it shows me that the person doesn't understand what I do. And so I wanted to bring that up to you because that can act as a really good warning sign in the sense that, you know, if you're maintaining your scope of practice, which if you haven't already, you can go back and listen to episode two of the podcast. I talked about scope of practice, which is what you can legally do in your business. If you're trying to maintain your scope of practice, you shouldn't really be like knowing all that information, right? You shouldn't be taking all of that in. And so sometimes when I get emails like that, where someone's telling me, I mean, like the most intense, long legal stories, or sometimes people attach legal documents and they send me these emails, I'm like, ooh, they don't understand what I do, right? And so in some cases, it's just an opportunity to write and say, thanks so much. But I actually, you know, in my case, it'd be like, yes, I'm an attorney, but I don't practice law. I don't represent anyone. I don't offer any legal services. I sell legal digital products, right? And so maybe they just misunderstand and it's totally fine to give them the benefit of the doubt and let them do with it what they want. But other times, and it's kind of a case by case basis, to me, that's a huge warning sign. And it's like, hey, um, I'm not the person for you. you. What you really need is a right? And maybe we can insert the blank here, like lawyer, doctor, therapist, whatever, right? Physical therapist, something. So they probably need something other than you. And that is a really good warning sign to see that this person might not respect your boundaries. They might not understand exactly what you do and your scope of practice. So I would say that's a really good second warning sign. Third and final warning sign I want you to pay attention to is when people ask you to prove yourself what beyond a reasonable amount, right? So whether somebody writes to you and says like, why should I hire you when I could just talk to my doctor? Or why should I talk to you when I could get my own therapist? Or whatever it is, right? Or sometimes I've heard people will like contact my copywriter friends and say like, I'm thinking about you and this other person, but like she seems so much better than you. So why should I hire you or something, something that kind of comes off rude. Right. And personally, I feel like people in our industry should just do the shopping themselves. Like, I don't think you should pass that on to somebody else, but that's like a separate podcast episode, I guess. But um, my husband, Ryan, always says that I should have a a podcast, uh, like a whole new podcast called And Another Thing, where I just go off on rants of like my pet peeves. One of them is when people write to you and ask you to prove yourself beyond a reasonable amount, right? Because I feel like you should look at, as a customer, you should look at the person that you're interested in hiring or buying from or whatever. And you do your research, just like you don't walk into like Target and ask them like, why are you better than Walmart? Like you just look at the products, you look at the prices, you think about which business you like better, or maybe the location you like better or whatever. And then as a consumer, you decide. So I don't know why people treat us differently in this industry, but they do. And personally, this is something that really irks me. And, you know, if people ask me like, what's the difference between your templates and someone else's, right? All I can do is talk about my products, right? All you can do is talk about your coaching. How can you compare yourself to these other people? I also don't really feel like that's a great headspace for you to be in or a great way for you to be spending your time. So personally, I will say like, you know, here you can check out my uh, references here or like listen to client stories here or learn more about my work here, my background 
I have a podcast. I have a blog. I have, I do all this stuff on Instagram, you know, here's all this stuff. But like beyond that, I'm not going to like argue for myself when my lawyer days are over. So like, I'm not arguing for myself. I don't have to justify and prove my worth in that way, right? I've done the work that has really proven that. And so I want you to protect yourself in that way. If someone asks for you to prove yourself in a way that you feel is unreasonable, right? Beyond just maybe asking some like logistical questions, like how does your program differ from this or something like that. So now those are a couple of my warning signs. If you have warning signs that you, you want me to include in the future, I would love for you to DM me on Instagram. Let me know what you think. But those are the biggest ones that came up for me when I was thinking about this today and I wanted to share with you. Otherwise, I think that it's really helpful to talk about then when to run, right? So we might get our ears perked up when some of these warning signs happen, but when is it right for you to bolt, okay? So I would say that it is right for you to run from a PETA client when they continually ask you to go outside of your scope of practice and don't respect you trying to stay within it and you you verbalizing like, hey, that's not within my scope. I, that's not something I can help you with, right? And of course, again, go back and listen to episode two, but make sure that you didn't kind of falsely advertise that you could help them with something that you can't, you know, you don't want to advertise that. And then when they ask you about it, be like, oh, I can't help you with that situation. So we want to make sure that we're consistent. And I talk a lot about it in that episode, but as long as you have done that, and and by the way, people might make a mistake, right? These clients might innocently just ask you a question or ask for you to do something for them. And they don't know that it's outside your scope. And so that's not the problem. The problem is when you tell them that and then they ask again and again and again and again, right? And they're not being respectful. And that that can apply across many different scenarios beyond just scope of practice, but continually disrespecting your boundaries, your wishes, the things that you ask for, it's not okay, right? So that is also a huge red flag for me, legally speaking, because if people are constantly asking you to go outside your scope, I am concerned that you're working with a client who needed something different than you. And that's where kind of going back to the beginning of this episode, I tell you, you know, yes, maybe it's just a client who was a pain and didn't listen, right? And maybe you did all the things. Maybe you properly talked about your scope and your copy was good and like all that stuff. Maybe you did all the things right, but if they still didn't listen, I am concerned about like them now working with you anymore. And it would be a good time for you to run, right? The other scenario though, that I talked about in the beginning of this episode is that that might also be a good time for you to look in the mirror and think, okay, let me go back and think about, was there anything in our call in our discovery call that maybe she could have taken away from that, that made her think that I could help her with this? Or was there anything in my marketing? Is there anything on my website, um, in my emails that made her think that I could help her with this? And so when that happens, it's always a good time to take a step back and just look in the mirror. And maybe you look and then you realize like, oh, there's nothing, you know, I think I did everything to the best of my ability. I'm not perfect. That's okay. We're not asking for perfection, but I don't think I was misleading in any way. I think this person just wasn't listening, right? And they slipped through your cracks. That's okay. But that would be, in my eyes, a good time for you to run. And like I said, at the end, we'll talk about how to properly run, how to properly terminate that client relationship so you don't get in legal trouble. So another scenario that I think would be a good time to run is that you find out that they, through maybe the course of your work together, through no fault of your own, that they need help outside of your scope and you're not the best person or the most qualified person to help them given what they need, right? I had a customer contact me the other day about a client expressing some suicidal ideation and, you know, that's wildly outside her scope. And so it was like, okay, this obviously wasn't uh, brought up when this person was coming on, but now I know. And so now it's a problem, right? And then it's about properly transitioning that person to get the right support and notifying the right people um, so that that person can get help in the right place, right? So that would be a good time for you not to work with a client anymore, right? If it's something that's wildly outside your scope, um, something like that really serious comes up, then that would be a good time for you to terminate that relationship. I would also say, I guess more on like the practical side, something that I hear I mean, on the side that like I hear about constantly is that people who clients who constantly disrespect your time, your space, especially the scope of the work. Right. I have a lot of friends who are in the copywriting space or like social media, um, like even uh, design, like graphic design work. 
And they are constantly telling me about people who will contact them and then be like, okay, well, can you also like add this on? Or can you like rewrite these emails again? Or can you just tack on an extra email? It's just an email, right? And I'm not saying again that you, you know, the person asked one time and then you're like, boop, you're done, terminated, <laughs> done. That's not what I'm saying. But people who continually do that, right? You've tried talking to them. You already have the language in your contract, right? You point back to the language in your contract. They still don't listen. They still ask. You still say no. They still ask again. Boom, terminated in my eyes, right? If it happens again and again and again, if it's not getting better, if the person's not willing to have the conversation, right? Then that is a time when I wouldn't work with a client anymore. Okay. Last but not least, I would definitely say that when it comes to payment, there can be some scenarios when you might want to run from a client. So if a client is not willing to pay you, if you are providing some sort of product or deliverable, I have heard of people in the past who've contacted me and said, you know, I have this client and my, or prospective client and my way of doing things is that, you know, they pay maybe like, let's say the person's a copywriter, they pay half up front. And then when the, before the work is delivered, then the person pays the balance and then the work is delivered. And sometimes they'll get a client who says, I'm not going to pay you anything until I see the work. Well, that's a hard no. That's a fa- run as fast as you can because that is not okay, right? We can't do that. We we don't want to be giving out deliverables. You know, I get very like emotional and very difficult to read on, on my end emails and stuff from people who have just gotten royally screwed by people who they produced websites for and wrote copy for or produced a program for and like a workout program. And then, you know, the person's like, mm, now that you sent it to me, I decided I don't want to pay for it. So we don't ever want to put ourselves in that position. So if someone is not comfortable paying you up front for what you're worth or whatever, or if they're really yanking you around about the price, even like forget about producing the work. But if somebody's really disrespectful about what you're asking to charge to me, that's a hard no. So I want you to look for that. Last but not least about when to run, I want to encourage you to absolutely run sprint, let's say from a person who is not comfortable signing your contract. So I have had a lot of people tell me like, oh, I sent this contract to this person. They're not okay signing with it, but I'm thinking I should work with them anyway because I really need the experience. No, 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 no. For so many different reasons, right? One, because why won't they sign a contract, right? Because if there's nothing wrong, if they don't intend to cut bait or try it before they buy it or any of these other things, then why would they be so fussed? As long as your contract's not asking for their firstborn, I don't understand what the problem is, right? Right. It's a very normal form of doing business, and it would be perfectly reasonable for you to have them sign a contract. So anyone who's not comfortable doing that, that is a huge, 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 huge red flag for me. And on your behalf, you should be very nervous about somebody who does that because you will have no method of enforcement. So in other words, if they stop paying you or they steal your content or they go to sue you, you have nothing to protect yourself, right? And it won't matter if you have text messages or emails or any of this other stuff. You need to have a properly formed contract that's properly signed, properly sent, all that kind of stuff. I have blog posts on all these things that we can link below about how to send and sign contracts, but you need to make sure that you're using a proper contract with your clients and that if they are not comfortable signing one, I would bolt. So in order to make sure that you don't have to bolt in the first place, let's talk a little bit about how to avoid problem clients in the first place, because my ideal scenario for you is that you wouldn't have to worry about any of these things. Like you wouldn't have to worry about what to do when the client stops paying you or how to properly terminate if you didn't end up in these situations in the first place. And of course, like we've talked about a few times today, it's inevitable, right? There are a few of these scenarios you're just not going to be able to prevent, but I think the bulk of them you actually can. So for me, maybe it's that, you know, I'm obsessed with marketing and I think so many things come down to marketing, but for me, uh, avoiding problem clients comes down to so much about making sure that your messaging is actually attracting the right people. And you want to focus on, I think, three things. So you want to focus on the way that you talk about money, maybe, you know, or how you talk about the cost of your program, the investment in your program, but also depending on what you do, maybe the way that you talk about money in general, and you might be inadvertently attracting people who have some mindset issues um, or some things around money, right? And so if you're ending up with a lot of PETA clients who are complaining about money or wanting their money back or wanting to cancel or bouncing their checks or credit card payments, then 
I think that would be a good time to look at your marketing messaging around money, right? And how do you talk about wealth or how do you talk about investment or how do you talk about the cost of your program? All of that I think would be a really good thing. The other thing is time, right? So how do you talk about time? If you talk about the way that in your marketing and your messaging, you're talking to people who are like super busy, have no time, like you're crunched, you're like blah, 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 blah. And you're kind of feeding into that mindset of the like, I don't have time. I'm super busy. Like I'm not willing to make time for this. I don't think that you can be super shocked when a bunch of your clients send up for your program and then all ask to cancel their payments because they're like, I don't have time for, for this program. Right. So it's just something to take a look at to see like, am I actually like feeding directly into the very thing that I'm trying to avoid? And so you're, you're actually attracting the people who struggle with that problem. You know, it might be something to think of last but not least, I would say, and then we want to think about how we're talking about things in our marketing and messaging with scope of practice, right? And as I talked about in episode two, you can't talk about like, so let's take a health coach, for example. You wouldn't be on Instagram doing Instagram stories, showing yourself making a meal plan or talking about blood work and lab work. And then someone comes to work with you. You can't be shocked when that person then is like, so like, here's my most recent blood work. Can you read it and interpret it for me? That's outside of your scope of practice if you're a health coach, right? You're not able to do that. That's illegal. But it, you can exactly be surprised if that's what your marketing messaging is. So I think sometimes if we end up with some of these problem clients, it's an invitation for us to step back and look at what our marketing messaging is. So really with marketing, you know, all things start, if we were if we were thinking about this in terms of attracting a client and we were looking at this and thinking of a kind of funnel of sorts, you know, our marketing is really at the top, right? What we're saying on social media, what we're writing in our posts, what we're writing to our email list. I hope you're emailing your list at least once a week. I have emailed my list one time a week for five years. <laughs> so make sure you're doing that. But you know, if we think about that as kind of the top, you know, the entrance, that's really important because that's like who you're going to attract. That's who you're going to take in, right? And so then we want to think about what are the steps from that top of the funnel, that entry point, the widest part of the upside down triangle to the tip of the triangle, which is to work with you, right? That's the premium, like mucho bucks, they should be working with you kind of thing. So um, we're attracting them with the right messaging. And then maybe they're opting into uh, some sort of freebie that you have, right? Your freebie should relate to the person that you want to attract to help with the thing that you can help with, right? The thing that your programs are designed to help with, the thing that your product is help is designed to solve, right? So we're attracting the right person with this freebie or a workshop or the download or whatever it is. And then we're nurturing them through emails and through more social media, maybe even Facebook ads, you know, all that kind of stuff. Again, always thinking about attracting the right person. And then maybe as we're getting to the bottom of that triangle, we're thinking about, depending on what you do, um, maybe somebody applying to work with you or applying to contact you or applying for your program. This for, if you're a coach and if you run any sort of program or do any sort of coaching, this to me is huge. This is a huge part of your triangle because this is a great filter for you. So I think having some sort of application where you have a number of questions that are pre-qualifying. So I call this a pre-qualifying, you know, client questionnaire or something like that. And actually in the ultimate bundle, I teach people about how to properly pre-qualify clients in, especially from like a legal perspective. Right. So we talk about that, but this is a really important part because we're kind of getting to the, like, you know, going back to the dating scenario, like this would be probably the part where the person's going to contact you to go on the date to find out if you want to get married. So this is a really important part of the process. And so through this pre-qualification process, I think you can ask people to jump through a little bit of hoops, right? So the application can be, you know, thorough. It kind of depends on like, who you're trying to attract. Like, do you want people who are really going to be dedicated and have a lot of time? Or do you want people who or you need people maybe who have a lot to invest financially? It kind of depends on what you're doing, right? So some people will knock people out with asking a lot of questions or asking if they're ready to invest, asking if there's anyone else who would need to be present on the call or who would need to be in contact who would be required to help make the decision, right? That's kind of knocking out the whole, I have to go talk to my partner or my spouse questions uh, or uh, responses. So it, you can ask things like that. You know, you could tell people what the general range is for the investment and if that's something that they're ready for, all of that kind of stuff. So 
I think that that's really helpful. Now, last but not least, I want to give you a hot tip. If you made it this far in the episode, I feel like this is the best tip yet, but this is just what my friends and my clients tell me. But when you book a call, so if you allow people to like book free calls with you or something like that, I think that one of the best things I ever did in my business when I was doing free calls until they got like wildly out of control was that after someone would book a free call, they would get a little drip series of, I think it was about three emails that will let them know what to expect on the call. And so it was an opportunity to learn a little bit more about me, learn a little bit more about my products. You know, at that time, I think I might've only been selling the, the like individual legal templates and then eventually the bundles. So telling them what that was, but more than anything, telling them what I can and can't do and what especially we will not be doing on the call. So in my scenario, it was like they would book a free call with me and then they would get these emails that would say like, thank you so much. And I can't wait to to talk with you. And here are all like the logistics, like the number to call and and where to be and, you know, yada, yada. But then I would tell them like, just so you know, I will not be giving you any legal advice on this call. So the way that this call works is that, you know, you'll tell me a little bit about your business. I might ask some qualifying questions and then I'll share with you about the program or the product that would be the best fit for you based on what you shared with me. I will not be telling you, you know, how to register your business, where to register your business, which contract you need, yada, yada, unless they were asking like which, you know, product to buy. But the point of this call is for me to take a little bit of information and find out if I can even help. Right. And it's not to give advice and it's not to give all of this information because first of all, the information I give is in my product. So you can get that. And if, if I'm the right fit for you, you can get that. And if it's advice, I can't do that in any way, right? And so do you see how this is kind of all coming together where this is legally protecting me too? Because I'm filtering out people and I'm not attracting people who are going to want me to go outside my scope of practice. I'm being super upfront. I'm saving my time and my energy and my mental health and all of that by not even getting on the phone in the first place, right? And then I would give them the opportunity to cancel. I'd say like, if you book this call and then now you realize like this is not what you thought, go ahead and cancel. Do you know what ended up happening? People, hardly anyone ever canceled, right? And if they did, it was perfect because they canceled and they'd be like, oh, thanks so much for telling me. I was actually only calling you because I wanted free legal advice. Like people legit say this to me in emails. I used to send them to friends all the time. I'd be like, this lady just wrote to me and said she only ever intended to pick my brain or get free advice. Or sometimes, I hope you're sitting down, sometimes people would write to me and tell me they bought legal templates from someone else and that they were just setting up the call with me for some customer service, like some help because they couldn't even get in touch with the person that they bought from. I couldn't believe it, right? Those were the definitely the minority. There were not there I did not get very many of those emails, but I did get some, right? And I was I was actually like relieved, right? It was like 20 30 minutes off my calendar that I had back to do something else that was better in revenue generating in my business. So it worked out, right? But do you know what happened with everyone else? They were solid. Basically, my sale rate, my close rate on all of these calls just skyrocketed because by the time they got on the phone with me, they were so primed, they were so ready, they understood what we were there for, right? And so we would have great conversation. We would connect personally. They would share a bit with me about them, and I would ask a lot of questions about their business and you know what they plan to do. And half the time, we would just start talking about business stuff and everything. And then we would talk about what the best fit was for them, if it was even the best fit. And people really appreciated when I would say, I'm not the person for you, right? It's not, this is, my products aren't going to help you. So that was huge. And if that helps you in any way, I hope that you institute this little baby funnel where people come kind of through your marketing funnel. And then if they have to fill out an application, have a call with you, automate a few emails to them that they can get to know you, understand what the call is and is not for, and give them an easy way to cancel or say, I'm so excited to talk with you about what, you know, I can help you with. So that one has been, or was huge for me when I was doing free calls. I hope that it would be for you. Last but not least, in terms of avoiding problem clients, I would just say that you have to get more comfortable with saying no. I think pretty much everyone I know in general is trying to work on this in life, but you have to be okay with saying no, even when you don't have a lot of clients and and aren't making a lot of money, right? Maybe things get tight, maybe things slow down, that is not an invitation to start saying yes to things that are uncomfortable or yes to things that are not safe for you, right? It's always a no. And so we have to be okay with saying no. And I realized that, you know, three, four years ago, if I was listening to someone like me say this, I would be like, easy for you to say, you know, because now you can do this. And I, and I felt like that at the time. So I feel that and I hear you. But I also know that the more that you can 
work on that. And the more that you can trust in this process and believe in your future, believe in the future of your business and know that it's not worth any of the short term gain for whatever you would get, you know, that you really have to take a long, long term approach to building your business. You know, I'm a huge proponent of this. And if you're in this for the long haul, the quick hits are not worth it. They will stress you out. You will end up losing money. You will end up spending a lot of time. You will have a lot of sleepless nights worrying and wondering if that, you know, whatever amount of money you took from this person was even worth it. It's not worth it. I can tell you right now. (laughs) So with that, I want you to just practice saying no. I would suggest sitting with the discomfort, you know, that comes with that of like, you know, am I being an idiot? I'm, I'm turning business away when I don't think things are going well. I had a lot of days like that, I can tell you. And I now on the other side of that experience, I'm just so glad that I stuck with it and I kept my head down and I kept speaking to the right person and kept saying no to the wrong one and for me. And the more you can do that, the, I think the faster you're going to get to that solid business foundation that, you know, I hope that you're looking for. I know that I was. So last but not least, when it comes to terminating a client, we want to make sure that we properly terminate our relationship with a client because we don't want to just walk away and say, like, see you later. So, you know, even good things come to an end and we want to end even good clients in a, in a good way. But if it's a bad client relationship, we want to make sure that we end things properly. And a lot of times that's like a termination letter, some sort of termination of contract letter. You might see this sometimes with physicians when uh, my mom's a doctor and when she has to kick people out of the practice, um, you know, you have to send a formal letter. You have to give a referral um, and let the person know. And you have to, there are state laws about like how much time you have to give them for medications and refills and things. But if you're not a doctor, you don't have to worry about that. But there are kind of similar forms of like a termination letter for people who do what we do. And so I would you know, let them know very plainly that you are terminating the contract. Obviously, you want to let them know that, you know, as of what date you're not providing services or access or whatever, but you also want them to know that they won't be charged. Like, you know, let's say they they were supposed to get charged for future months and you haven't performed those services, then the person shouldn't be getting charged for that, you know? So you would want to let them know. You could always spell out the reasons that you're terminating the contract, but you kind of want to keep it brief and to the point because you don't want to get into it. We kind of want to keep it to the facts. We don't want to make it super like emotional, um, like you were mean to me. You don't respect my boundaries. I like if it was that case, I would more say like for a continual violation of section three of our contract, you know, like we want to think and talk like lawyers here, not like you hurt my feelings, you know, which is super valid, just not in, in this <laughs> in this way. So we want to do that. We want to explain how things will wrap up, kind of want to give them next steps. If there's anything that you still owe them or access that you're giving them or something like that. If you have a referral, that would be awesome. If there's somebody who could help them better. This is especially true when it's somebody who needs help outside of your scope of practice. It would be great to put them, put them in touch with someone who could help them. Right. And I would just thank them and be kind of, you know, gracious and positive and end on a positive note. But I'm actually going to link to a blog post that I wrote on this topic um, at the bottom of this podcast episode called how to terminate a contract with a client because I go into detail in this blog post all about how to properly terminate a client contract. So with that, I hope that this episode was helpful to you today. I would absolutely love it if you took a screenshot of this episode, tag me on Instagram at Sam Vander Whelan, send me a DM. Let me know what you thought about this episode. Was it helpful? Was there anything? What was your biggest takeaway from this episode? I would love to know, especially if there was going to be something that you're going to do differently, or maybe something that you realize that you are doing with clients. I know a lot of people, when I've talked about this on social media before, will just say like, thanks for telling me that this is normal because I was thinking it was just me. Right. And so I hope more than anything today that you did take away that this is a normal part of building your business. You are not expected to nail this. All of your clients are not going to be perfect and that's okay, right? And just like anything in life, you're going to be climbing this mountain and getting better and better at this. And then you're going to slip up or you're going to have a little like blip on the radar where something's going to happen. You're going to be like, oh, what did I do wrong? And maybe you didn't do anything wrong. Maybe this person was just a little nutty and that's okay, right? That's okay. So maybe they were just having a moment. That's okay. And so we don't want to take this um, so personally 
at the same time, we can also take this as feedback and data for what we can do differently or better, if anything at all. So I hope this episode was helpful. Send me a DM. Let me know what you think. Otherwise, check out the show notes for all the links to the blog post that I talked about today. Otherwise, I can't wait to chat with you next week. Thanks for listening to On Your Terms. Make sure, please, please, please keep building your business on your terms. Thanks so much for listening to the On Your Terms podcast. Make sure to follow on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you like to listen to podcasts. You can also check out all of our podcast episodes, show notes, links, and more at samvanderreelen.com slash podcast. You can learn more about legally protecting your business and take my free legal workshop, Five Steps to Legally Protect and Grow Your Online Business at samvanderreelen.com. And to stay connected and follow along, follow me on Instagram at samvanderreelen and send me a DM to say hi.